Very strange. Good afternoon. It's Monday the 15th of uh, January 2018, just after one o'clock. Welcome to UK Column News. I'm your host, Mike Robinson, and uh, joining me in the studio, well, not in the studio uh, via video link, is Mark Anderson from American Free Press. Uh, welcome to the program, Mark. Good morning from Texas, Mike. Uh, so uh, you've uh, headed back from Michigan to Texas. Uh, is it uh, has it is it is it still winter there, or are you heading towards uh, uh, some more sensible weather? Oh, I'm I'm staying in the sensible weather. I actually won't be going to Michigan till the spring. I almost went there, but that didn't happen. So uh, I'm I'm here in Texas, and here we go. Okay, well we're going to kick off today uh, with um, with Carillion, uh, and uh, of course uh, this is the uh, the news that. Uh, Carillion ha has gone out of business today. This is one of these huge, Mark, one of these huge uh, services companies that uh, gets involved in building uh, work, uh, large infrastructure projects and all kinds of other kind of uh, managed services, contracts and so on. Uh, and they have, uh, a winding up order has been issued this morning for that. Uh, so that's 48,500 jobs at risk. Uh, and uh, in addition to debts, which are coming close to a billion pounds, uh, they also have a huge pensions deficit. Uh, it says six hundred and eighty million pound black hole on screen there. Actually, the figure is a bit vague. So Carillion themselves have said that their pension deficit is five hundred and eighty seven million pounds. Uh, but the problem with it is that there are twenty eight and a half thousand people that are in uh, thirteen different final salary schemes. These are pension schemes that are linked to the uh, employee's final salary. Uh, many of those people are already uh, retired and receiving uh, their pensions. Um, another 27,000 people that are probably current employees of Carillion are members of the uh, what are called defined benefit schemes. These are uh, after the sort of uh, final uh, salary schemes became unfashionable with private corporations. They created these uh, defined benefit schemes and these defined benefit schemes are likely to go to the Pension Protection Fund. And we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, so it's a very complicated picture. Uh, some people saying that it's going to be around £680 million is going to be the black hole. Other people saying it could be as much as £800 million. Uh, and, uh, well, it's going to go to the uh, the Pension Protection Fund, which is uh, this organisation you can see on screen. This is their website. Uh, this organisation answers to the Department for Work and Pensions. But it's funded by a levy on other pension schemes. So pension schemes that are uh, run through other companies that are still solvent pay a contribution towards the uh, the Pension Protection Fund. And that money is uh, then used uh, to, to fund uh, pensions where private corporations like Carillion have basically stolen uh, pensioners' money. Uh, so uh, this is uh, how they're looking at the moment. Uh, they seem to have about £6 billion pounds or so uh, in cash at the moment, plus quite a significant uh, amount of money in, in investments and so on. Um, and if we look at the number of uh, uh, pensions that they've had to take over, uh, we see that uh, in 2015 they took over, what was that, 30, I think that's uh, uh, 30, 33 pensions and 62 pension schemes taken over in 2017. So this is, it's not, a, it's not an insignificant problem that we have uh, private companies uh, taking money or at least not paying the uh, requisite uh, amounts of money into pension schemes, uh, which leave pension schemes with a shortfall. And then those companies go out of business, uh, leaving the uh, pension schemes, uh, well, in trouble because the company is insolvent. They've got no more money to, uh, to pay in uh, and they're not likely to have any money uh, once the insolvency process is complete to pay in. And pensioners, obviously, are people uh, that have been employed by the company losing out uh, big style. Is this, uh, Mark, I, I don't know if you know the answer to this, but is this a common problem in the United States that, that uh, companies are are stealing, effectively stealing money out of pension pots uh, to fund their businesses uh, in, in recent years? Uh, yes, it is in a way, Mike. I don't know all the minutiae on it on your side of the pond or mine. Uh, one of the things that happened is uh, the good old fashioned pension along with the gold watch and the plaque on your wall and all the things that used to be the hallmark of a uh, you know long career and retiring from a long career in the United States have been largely cast to the wind. 
the old-fashioned pension is gone, and many of them have been privatized in the states. How much they resemble in terms of corruption and mismanagement, uh, what's going on in the UK, I'm not absolutely sure, but certainly the whole pension system here has been weakened, and people have been encouraged to get into IRAs, particularly 401ks, and privately uh, take care of their own retirement on their own steam. <clears throat> Companies might kick in matching funds to an IRA or 401k and niceties like that. But the, the pension, the classic pension in the United States is just about gone. Uh, they, they really kind of went the way of the Edsel uh, probably right around 2000, right around the turn of the century. So it is a big concern. Um, there, there is some uh, other th things that uh, tie into some geopolitical matters regarding Israeli bonds and the states trying to fight the anti-BDS movement. I don't know if that fits into the paradigm of what we're talking about today, but the, the mismanagement is there. It's just a matter of getting at the details. Uh, well, you know, just to come back to a point that I, that I went, that I passed over there, and, and that is the fact that, that the, the, payment, uh, the, the pension protection fund is funded by a levy on other pension schemes, which means that people that are paying into a pension scheme, uh, works pension scheme, uh, are having some of that money taken away and put into the payment protection fund. Now, you could say that that uh, could be viewed as a form of insurance policy on your own pension scheme. But at the same time, uh, it seems to me like it's, you're, you're effectively funding, uh, you're funding private companies' bad behavior because there's an assumption uh, that the private, the private companies are not going to, uh, are, are not going to fund uh, to the degree that they've that they've promised to fund a pension scheme, so you're you're effectively subsidising that bad behaviour, and that seems to be. Uh, uh, if we look at, uh, for example, the the way the trade deals are going at the moment, uh, this seems to be something. If you take it to, to in a slightly different direction, we are we are encouraging bad behaviour in in private companies. Oh, absolutely! It's a it's a redistribution scheme uh, instead of. Uh, fresh money coming in, they're moving existing money around, much like in our taxation. We could have monetary reform where uh, new interest-free money, perhaps something so somewhat modeled on the Bradbury Pound with some uh, modern and uh, adornments and some adjustments. We could have, for example, the government could create a certain amount of interest-free money and support the pensions. <clears throat> that would be better than uh, shuffling existing money around between pensions. Um, you know, instead, the, uh, the, our governments will fund pipelines in other countries. They'll help, they'll help through the Overseas Private Investment Corporation in the United States. Uh, companies will get subsidies from the U.S. government to, you know, uh, uh, grow businesses or, or uh, build pipelines overseas. The, the governments don't mind subsidizing the corporations on the production end. But when it comes to paying retired workers, suddenly subsidies are socialism or a bad thing. There's a lot of hypocrisy and a lot of double standards going on. It, so in my view, it would, it would be better if the government, through a better monetary policy without all the usury and interest, would, would create a certain amount of money and create a supportive floor or foundation uh, to help all these workers that have given all their lives to these companies and, um, and in a sense, uh, prevent this redistribution and so on and so forth. Maybe it would have to be not too large, but enough to where this, these kind of shenanigans go on. That would be one option. Maybe there are others. Uh, yeah, others like uh, like just prosecuting the bad behavior, people for the bad behavior in the first place. Um, but look, uh, let's move on then to uh, uh, census uh, because uh, the well, a couple of the mainstream papers in uh, in the UK today pointing out that uh, the next UK census is uh, coming up. Uh, in 2021, and the Office for National Statistics is already getting prepared for it. They've been running a, a number of public consultations on how they uh, organise uh, the upcoming census and what kind of questions that they ask. Uh, and so, if we look at the uh, mainstream stories that were going on, that were being dis uh, published today, uh, they're saying that uh, the National Statistics Office is going to use uh, uh, people's tax records in order to get data to publish. Uh, what uh, salaries are like a bit, uh, around various parts of the country. Uh, they are going to, uh, so they're going to publish information on wage levels uh, and they're going to ask people to disclose sexual preferences and also if they're transgender. Uh, and uh, so uh, they are going to uh, also, which I thought is a, 
way beyond just one government department accessing the data of another government department. Uh, they are also going to use data supplied by Vodafone uh, to look at people's daily commute. Uh, and so they're going to provide information about how people are using public transport, whether they're using public transport or whether they're using the roads and so on. Um, now, this follows on from a uh, blog post, actually, that the uh, Office for National Statistics published in, in mid-December. Uh, it was written by uh, Ian Bell, the Deputy National St Statistician for Population and Public Policy. Uh, and they were listing some of the decisions that had already been made uh, with regard to the upcoming uh, a census, they said that they're going to include a question on armed forces veterans to support local and central government's duties to look after veterans. Uh, they're going to continue to include a question on, a number, on the number of bedrooms in houses, in people's homes, uh, but they're going to use data from the Valuation Office Agency to provide that information, uh, so they're not going to rely on people to tell the truth on the census forms. And they're also going to look for uh, data on, for example, floor space, uh, because that uh, helps them understand crowded living conditions, they say. Uh, they're not going to include a question on uh, whether people are volunteering their time to charities and other uh, NGOs, uh, because they say they've been unable to develop a question which accu accurately collects the information required by census users. Uh, and they do hint that they're going to uh, access uh, uh, HMRC information uh, to get hold of wage level information because they say that uh, on income our research from administrative data is showing promise for meeting this long-standing user need uh, and so we would not need to collect from this directly from the census form itself uh, so <laughs> this is this is uh, moving a step forward with with big data collection uh, and certainly in the uh, mainstream press and the mail and the times and others that i saw they're they're using they're calling this the you know they're they're suggesting that this is similar to the doomsday book if you remember from the from Norman times where when William the Conqueror went around and uh, and gathered up information about old people's land holdings uh, so this is the type of scale that they're talking about uh, across all these areas the move to predominantly online census must may give us new and innov innovative ways of meeting needs so uh, they are absolutely getting. Uh, mark on board uh, the big data agenda uh, and uh, well uh, we're seeing government departments increasingly connecting their computer systems <coughs> building uh, huger bigger and bigger databases uh, this is another example of it oh certainly what I've been hearing and I understand it to be true is that the US census also which is every 10 years 2000 2010 2020 the U.S. Census will also get into the into the gender bender, into uh, enumerating uh, how many people are this this gender or that gender or cross gender or any one of some 21 gender variations that National Geographic has told us exist. So um, the U.S. is going much the same way. Of course, the census was originally created in the United States simply and only for numerating or enumerating, right as it says in the Constitution, enumeration to count people for congressional representation, and that was it. And that's really all it should be for, maybe a couple other sundry things, but it should be for representation in local, provincial, or state, and national government, and very little else. That's what it's supposed to be for, that's what it should be for. Um, you know, maybe a landlord would do, you know, a survey to make sure there's not too many people living in his house or something. But this is way beyond the pale in terms of U.S. jurisprudence, in terms of our Constitution. I don't know if the census was originally intended in the U.K. and its Commonwealth, uh, you know, outlying lands, if it was originally intended only to be for political representation in Parliament. Maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. But it's way beyond the mandate here, and uh, it's just another aspect of the deep state in many respects. Uh, well, I believe it's not the case that, it was, that that was the purpose of the census in this country. I think it's always been about land, uh, land ownership, uh, use of land, and so on. Uh, but uh, anyway, we shall move on uh, to the uh, st city agenda uh, because uh, this is uh, Sadiq Khan at his work again uh, because it's not sufficient that he is uh, simply mayor of London anymore. He has to be traveling the world and uh, pushing forward the uh, globalist city's agenda to others. Uh, and in this case, he was meeting uh, Sampath Raj, who's the mayor of uh, Bangalore, uh, 
uh, and they've agreed that the two cities are going to lead a global partnership on tackling air pollution. Now, this is something that uh, Sadiq Khan has been uh, really pushing forward with over the, quite a period of time now. He's saying that London is also going to start a trial uh, of new £750,000 sensor air quality monitoring system that will be used to analyse harmful pollution uh, in up to 1,000 toxic hotspots across London, uh, including near schools, hospitals, construction sites and busy roads. Uh, and so uh, he said, only by working together will we help beat this international health crisis and protect people from breathing in air so filthy it damages their lungs and causes diseases. I'm doing everything I'm in power to clean up London's lethal air from introducing the world's first toxicity charge for older, more polluting cars and bringing forward the ultra-low emission zone uh, to cleaning up our bus and taxi fleet. Uh, the so this is something that's being pushed from the United Nations through the World Health Organization and so on. Uh, and uh, Mark, I have to say it fascinates me that he's pushing so hard on this uh, because it's only uh, six weeks or so uh, since this uh, map was produced. Uh, and this is uh, an air quality map. Uh, it's an interactive air quality map. We reported on it at the time in, in mid-November, an interactive map. Uh, which makes it possible to find out the quality of air in real time in cities and regions across Europe, uh, where they say that air pollution is the single biggest environmental health risk. Uh, this is called the, if you want to search for it, it's called the European Quality Index, and it allows people to find out whether they're breathing safe air or whether they're breathing in dangerous air. Uh, and, uh, you know, we pointed out at the time that if you look at the European map, actually the UK is not doing too badly. We're mostly green. Uh, dots. Uh, you start seeing things not so great in the south of Spain uh, and also in Eastern Europe and particularly in Poland and that's because there's uh, still such a high proportion of people burning coal there. Uh, coal's basically outlawed in Britain now. Uh, and if we, if we just zoom in on London uh, and you can go and look at this and you can continue, continue to zoom in on London and you find that basically there's not much evidence of bad air quality, you know, in terms of in terms of the levels that are internationally recognised as being particularly harmful to health, uh, th there isn't really an issue in London. Uh, and so Sadiq Khan is clearly pushing some other type of, of agenda. And if you look at the colour of the dots on there, they are considered to be good or fair. And there aren't any in London that are considered to be poor or very poor. So, uh, you know, uh, this is clearly something else, Mark, as I say, other than uh, air quality issue for London. Oh, certainly. It's political primarily. I mean, on the practical level, one of the reasons we even have public buses and public transportation and trams and subways and and taxis and Uber and, and Lyft and all that is so more people can go into fewer cars so there's less traffic and theoretically less pollution. The cars that you see taxis using these days in the United States are extremely clean. Um, uh, dual cell cars that run partly electric and partly fuel or that use E85 and, and flex fuel. Um, there's plenty of innovation going on right here, right now on your side of the pond and mine to reduce pollution at the automotive level. That's the, that's the whole point or one of the points of having public transportation and taxis to begin with. It's kind of like carpooling. But if you go up the ladder, things get very political, as we've uh, accurately uh, described and found, Mike. And that is that uh, there's a, a story I put in the previous, previous to the current edition of American Free Press. I put in a story about Jerry Brown, the governor of California. And he's much like Sadiq Khan, the mayor of London, and, and Iram Emanuel, the mayor of Chicago. These guys see themselves as the new vanguard of international diplomacy and treaty making. And that's under the U.S. Constitution. That's plainly illegal. State and local officials, including mayors, are not international ambassadors and are not allowed to make treaties or international pacts. And so they're using, to a large extent, they're using the climate issue, pollution, uh, global warming, and so on and so forth, to forge a new kind of governance. They're using it as a uh, leverage, a, a, um, a, a means of getting a new kind of government. And when you read the language in their pronouncements, they, they use the words like subnational governments. Subnational governments must take the lead. Subnational governments must 
uh, provide leadership and, and lead the way into this promised land of clean air, even though the air is already clean in many instances. And uh, in fact, after the Chicago National Mayor Summit, the National uh, uh, Climate Summit that they held recently in early December in Chicago, the national mayors from around the world met again in France in late December, and they're having a big climate summit of mayors and state governors in California next year. Uh, in San Francisco, I believe it is. So they're they're moving forward, having meeting after meeting. Chicago, San Fr or, excuse me, Chicago, Paris, France. Once again, Paris, France, just like three years ago, but not as big as the Paris summit then. But then San Francisco next uh, September. Without looking at it, I believe it's in September. So it's all about a new form of governance, and they're going to sell carbon credits. There's going to be profiteering going on. A whole new a uh, scheme of money making going on with the power brokers and using the climate and pollution issue largely, maybe not completely, but largely to rebuild governance uh, toward a grassroots globalism as we've referred to it before. Okay, thank you very much, Mark, for that. Uh, let's move on to the States now. And you uh, put an article in the current edition of uh, American Free Press uh, headlined, Award-Winning Journalist Comes Clean. Uh, so this is uh, the is he the former uh, national security uh, reporter for the New York Times uh, talking about the deep state? Uh, yes, uh, he writes for the Intercept now, and the Intercept has its own ownership issues that we'll talk about another time. But what's interesting about this is that James Risen kind of had to come to grips with the fact that things are getting collusive. Dare we use the word conspiratorial? And what he found was that uh, back a few years back, well, several years back, when, when the war on terror was just getting going, 9-11 had happened. And some of his experiences go back to four, before the 9-11 attacks in New York and Washington and the Pennsylvania incident. But a little bit before 9-11 and, and during a little bit and since, he found that whenever he wrote about issues that would question the U.S. war machine, that would uh, question whether Iraq really had uh, relations with Al Qaeda, because of course the the conventional story was that Al Qaeda was responsible for 9/11. So he did a story, for example, that questioned whether Iraq really had uh, secret connections with Al Qaeda, because of course the U.S. attacked with a coalition. We attacked Iraq in March of 2003. We're going on 15 years ago on that anniversary this coming March. So he was questioning at just the right points in time whether Iraq really was talking with Al Qaeda in a clandestine fashion, whether there really was collusion there. Uh, should the U.S. Uh, go full bore to war over the war on terror? Do we really know what happened on 9-11? He, he, he knocked on the door of that, at least. Maybe he didn't get into it completely. And uh, so over the years, he found that his bosses at the New York Times would go to bat for the government, would go to bat for the deep state, would go to bat for the CIA. And his stories that were questioning the U.S. war policy, um, even in the early days and since then, were being buried or cut or put on ice and not run at all. And, and so he got to understand that the New York Times was really in bed with the deep state to a large extent. Uh, his stories, he felt, were among the best that would tell, you know, more timely truths as to what was going on. And so once he saw the pattern, he eventually had to back out of the times um, as his story goes. And on The Intercept, he's got a pretty long explanation of his journey. And that's what this story is based on. And in the end, and you'll see that at the end of my American Free Press article that you just showed, in the end, he found that there was constant uh, intercommunications going on between the CIA, the, the White House, key members of Congress and their committees, bureaucracies, and key media outlets, all exchanging information, not publicly, but privately, so, so as to carry out damage control and to avoid major embarrassment and to avoid the fact that uh, major media knows a lot about what's going on in the deep state and is collaborating with the deep state on a daily basis and largely not reporting it. That means that the media is, I'm going to say it, conspiring with the deep state to bury or alter news that we should know about uh, in order to prevent war 
in order to stop the interventionist foreign policy of the U.S. and, and to some extent the U.K. in these coalition efforts. So James Risen had something of an awakening is how the story basically uh, comes out that, you know, there really is this collusion between big media and the prestige, pre excuse me, between the deep state and the prestige press. And it's just a question now, Mike, of how far he wants to admit this, how much he wants to acknowledge it. But he does acknowledge it, as I say, on the Intercept website, and I reflect that through this article. Um, and uh, do you think there has been collusion with the press uh, in the coverage of the Bundy trial? To a less extent, the, the Las Vegas Review Journal in this Southern Nevada trial has been reasonably good. Uh, I'll mention up front because I mentioned that newspaper, which, by the way, is owned by Sheldon Adelson, the uh, Jewish power broker and financier and, um, um, you know, uh, do huge donor for Republican candidates. But that aside, that little factino aside, the Las Vegas Reju Review Journal right now being among the regionalized mainstream media is, to their credit, they're trying to get the uh, federal prosecutors to open all their files uh, for one thing to see if there's been illegally secret court hearings held, court hearings that should have been uh, public and were, were held secretly or privately or maybe secret court hearings that were never announced at all. Uh, that's, among other things, uh, the positioning of snipers around Rancher Clive and Bundy's property, uh, all the tactics used by armed federal agents. They're trying to bring this out through the Las Vegas Review Journal's um, effort to get the prosecution in that case to open their files. But as you know, that's that case is wrapping up, and I think you wanted to cover s some more of that today. Well, you, your front page of the current uh, American Free Press has got an article by you, uh, Bundy's Freed, uh, Judge Tosses Entire Case Due to Federal Misconduct, uh, and you, you've then expanded on that for 21st Century War. Yeah, that's correct. Um, there's a lot that could be said about this case. I talked to Clive and Bundy. He said, I went into prison a free man, and that was in early 2016 and I intended to leave as a free man. He, he's a very principled individual, very interesting guy to talk to, uh, very laid back, but very constitutionally schooled, very constitutionally aware. He knows his rights from A to Z. You're not gonna put one past this guy on, on the legal or constitutional level. And this thing wrapped up on December 20th, they declared a mistrial and I wrote about that. And then on January 8th, there was a hearing and Judge Gloria Navarro, a rather liberal judge who had been pretty hard on the defendants so far, dismissed the case with prejudice. With prejudice means that the government would have to seek a new indictment if, if it wanted to go after the Bundys again. Uh, to, to dismiss this case only affects Cliven, his sons Ammon and Ryan, and another defendant named Ryan Payne. There is theoretically one more trial coming up involving two more of his sons, Mel and Dave, and a couple other defendants. But the, a legal expert I talked to thinks that case likely will be dismissed too. So this thing is not completely over as some media outlets are giving you the impression that it is, but it's largely over. And the big trial that involved Cliven and company is the one that was dismissed. And there's been a lot of celebration going on and a lot now to reflect on. And uh, Patrick Henningsen is saying, um, of course, he's our, our frequent partner here on the UK column. He's been saying that this vindicates his coverage ever since 2014 in the spring when the Bundy affair first happened, when the BLM and armed FBI agents first descended upon the Bundy, uh, near the Bundy ranch to the public land where his cattle have been grazing for decades. He's been a, a rancher for um, um, you know many, many years. It's a multi-generational ranching family. Patrick on 21 Wire feels his coverage has been vindicated, as I said, and the same goes for American free press coverage uh, ever since the spring of April, uh, April of 2014. So this thing has come a long way. Uh, the federal government showed a lot of muscle, a lot of uh, uh, armed power at first, but uh, the principled stand of the Bundy family led by Cliven, the elder, uh, really held the day. And what's really significant, Mike, is a lot of these things typically end badly. 25 years ago this year was the Waco affair, about seven hours north of me here in Texas. And we've had the Oklahoma City bombing, and we've had, um, oh, going back to even events like Kent State in Ohio during Vietnam War protests, uh, also the Randy Weaver affair in Idaho, 
where Randy's wife was shot by a noted uh, expert marksman of the federal government while she was holding a child. Um, so many of these things end badly and end in death and destruction and tragedy. This one did not on the um, right on the 25th year of the of the Waco affair. That's really significant in and of itself. And and again, much could be said about this, but it's really a triumph for the Bundy family in many ways. And it speaks to the fact that maybe the federal government uh, ought not to rule uh, so much land west of the Mississippi River, millions and millions of acres with such an iron fist. Maybe they now need, need to uh, divest themselves of some of that land. It's probably collateral for the U.S. national debt anyway, many theorize. And, and return that land to the states, return it to private ownership, build the tax base, um, you know, uh, set free these ranchers that are being uh, uh, overly regulated like the Bundys. Uh, so a lot can be brought from this, a lot of precedents set and a lot of lessons learned, but those are the highlights. And so we'll see if there's gonna be another small trial. Uh, there probably won't be, but we'll be watching that. And we'll see if property rights loosen up. We'll see if uh, federal land policy might change. We'll see if any members of Congress talk about that. And there's there's much to be learned in the days and weeks and months ahead, uh, as well as what just happened. Brilliant. Thank you very much for that, Mark. Now we're going to uh, head to uh, Burma, but on the way, we're going to look at the BBC. Uh, the Today programme on Radio 4 this morning uh, was... Uh, well, it was partly presented from uh, Bangladesh, Myanmar bar, bar, uh, border, sorry, by Michelle Hussein, uh, where she was visiting the what she described as the world's largest refugee camp, uh, 500,000 people in that camp. Uh, and uh, this is uh, happened, this, she was there, I suppose, because uh, today uh, talks are taking place to, quote, settle issues uh, over uh, whether Rohingya refugees will be repatriated uh, to Myanmar, uh, and uh, uh, I think there's some difficulty about whether that's going to happen. It certainly isn't going to happen in any great hurry, and there's a lot of concern over what's going to happen to these people uh, who are in uh, some pretty horrendous uh, conditions in on the Bangladesh Bangladeshi side of the border uh, and coming towards the, uh, the monsoon season, and uh, lots of concerns over mudslides, uh, and uh, no real protection for quite a lot of people. Um, now, uh, Burma, of course, has uh, agreed to repatriate refugees, but as I say, there's no real sign of that happening uh, before the rainy season this year. Uh, now, the Today programme is a three-hour long programme, and they spent quite a long time discussing this this morning. So the question is, uh, you know, why? Well, part of it, of course, is because the uh, uh, UNHCR is so keen to, ha to have this uh, back in the media agenda. Uh, and so earlier on today, the BBC Radio 4 Today programme pushed out this tweet. Uh, and the uh, tweet said, just one of the drawings by Rohingya children uh, in Bangladesh. Uh, and there we see a guy holding a gun uh, and some trees and a house on fire uh, and somebody uh, on fire, a, an adult, a parent, I suppose, on fire and the sun in the sky. So it did, something just didn't quite add up for me here, Mark, and I just wanted to sort of highlight this point. If we look at this person who's holding the gun, this person who's supposed to have uh, carried out the, uh, the atrocities in Myanmar, I have a question for you, and I know I'm springing this on you and uh, you haven't seen this before, but does that person look like a Burmese uh, military individual? Uh, or does that person look much more like an ISIS terrorist. Uh, it seems to me that the latter is the case. You, you can tell me what you think, Mark, but uh, if we look back at that, uh, that child's drawing, this does not look like a Burmese uh, soldier to me. So uh, I wonder whether the BBC has actually not been terribly clever to push this drawing out as they have. Oh, yeah, first blush. And you're right, Mike, I don't know much about this issue yet, but it looks like the hair coming down on the sides of the soldier. There's no helmet. A Burmese soldier obviously has a very obvious helmet. Well, first, first uh, of all, they're very... clean shaven. Uh, they, they, they wear a helmet uh, and, uh, and, they, right. and they don't have long hair. Right. The beard being the next uh, very obvious thing. That, that's correct. And a child obviously would just reflect what they saw. There's no reason to bend anything. Um, 
so yeah, that's a very good hunch and a very good guess that that's not a Burmese soldier, but is in fact an ISIS agent of some kind. Correct. That's that's logical. Yes. So anyway, as I say, the UNHCR uh, pushing forward with this, uh, and they're concerned that uh, the Rohingya are a stateless Muslim minority in Myanmar. Is what they say on this page from the UNHCR's website. The latest exodus began on the 25th of August 2017 when violence broke out in Myanmar's uh, Rakhine state. Uh, the vast majority of Rohingya refugees reaching Bangladesh are women and children, including newborn babies. Many others are elderly, requiring additional aid and protection. They have nothing and need everything. And one of the things, Mark, which uh, has fascinated me about the whole uh, discussion on this uh, is the issue of human rights. Uh, because, of course, what the first line of what the UN says on this uh, on this website is the Rohingya are a stateless Muslim minority in Myanmar. Uh, and in all the coverage or, that I was listening to on the Radio 4 Today program this morning, uh, one of the points that was being made uh, was uh, this issue of uh, rights, that they don't get their basic rights, their basic rights if they don't have, uh, they don't belong to a state. Uh, and this comes for me to the heart of the whole human rights debate, uh, which of course the United Nations is pushing very hard. The notion that you as a human being don't have any rights unless they're conferred upon you by the state and unless they're protected by the state. And to me, this just seems like a dangerous position to be starting from. If you're a human being, flesh and blood man or woman or child, you have rights which are unalienable. This is represented in the British Constitution, is represented in the US Constitution. Uh, these rights are presumed, aside from anything else, aside from any protections that the state provides. Uh, that is the ultimate fundamental lesson here, Mike. You're absolutely right. Uh, the Declaration of Independence uh, uh, had an organic basis that therefore inspired US law and the Constitution. And as you say, that carries over and is uh, also true on your side of the pond, that, that rights are a pre-existing, dare we say, God-given in this atheistic age we live in, a God-given, naturally occurring, inherent thing that the state is then supposed to protect. So if people go from one country to another as these refugees you're talking about, whatever the case, uh, the fact that whether they're stateless or not, and all this talk in the in the big media about non-state actors and stateless people, well, if they want to go that far, I could say that I'm stateless because the corporations and the Federal Reserve and the central banks have taken over and hijacked my country. Isn't that a failing state? Isn't that a state in peril, if not if not actually dissolved, possibly? Maybe our governments have been dissolved. Even if our governments had been dissolved yesterday noon, we still have rights whether those governments even exist or not. Our rights are inherent, they are organic. So assuming our governments are legitimate governments, uh, then they need to recognize that pre-existing value and reality of our uh, political and civil rights. Um, and that, that includes the right of survival. So uh, there's a huge lesson there in terms of government and political science. Um, well, uh, one right that the government, uh, the British government at least, uh, is determined that the Rohingya uh, have, whether they're stateless or not, is the right to be vaccinated. Uh, and, uh, of course, uh, UK aid uh, is uh, pushing £2 million uh, of a, an overall budget of $4.6 million. So that's uh, so it's £2 million of £3.4 million. Pounds. Uh, that's required to vaccinate 351,458 children aged six weeks to 15 years as part of a campaign to deal uh, with, uh, with diphtheria uh, in the uh, refugee camps. Uh, this is part of a wider UNICEF vaccination campaign, which will also vaccinate 130,000 school children living in the host communities uh, near to the camps, uh, near to the camp, sorry, uh, in Cox's Bazar in, in uh, Bangladesh. Uh, funding for this uh, vaccination campaign has been provided from the response budget, which was announced on the 23rd of October uh, and all, again announced on the 27th of November last year. Uh, and medics have been working tirelessly, apparently, to ensure the swift vaccination of those most at risk. And to date, 315,889 children have been reached. Uh, so I would like to see uh, some statistics on, uh, on how many of them uh, have been uh, protected in some way, how many of them may have been uh, 
damaged by uh, the vaccines that have been uh, presented. But, you know, again, this is a bit like uh, the, the pensions problem, Mark. What we have here is aid money being used to subsidize uh, uh, pharmaceutical companies, it seems to me, uh, because I'm not convinced that, uh, that these vaccinations are required in these cases. Well, yeah, I mean, part of the subsidy, Mike, excuse me, part of the subsidy is the very fact that they act like vaccinations are the only way to raise and, and uh, in, uh, intensify human immunity. I mean, there's everything from vitamin C to olive leaf extract to garlic to uh, uh, echinacea, all sorts of nutritional things. Uh, as Hippocrates said, let thy food be thy medicine, let thy medicine be thy food. Doctors take the Hippocratic Oath, and yet they ignore that uh, Hi Hippocrates actually said that uh, nutrition had a lot to do with medicine and, and, it w and wellness. Uh, that's the first thing. So just the fact that they only rely on vaccines and they're purchased from these companies is, in, is by itself a form of subsidy. And then if you have actual subsidies, that compounds the problem. And then you have to question, how long have these vaccines been in storage? Uh, all the different uh, batches of vaccines. Uh, was the vaccine developed in a safe and, and uh, careful way? Was it tested properly? Um, what do we know about the thimerosal and the mercury-based preservatives that might be in the vaccine that are that are very dangerous to to many of the adrenal organs and other parts of the body? Um, there's a whole host of questions about vaccinations themselves. Uh, and then you'd have to know what company made these vaccines, the the batches, the storage, the shelf life, the expiration, the testing, the safety, a whole litany of things that need to be vetted. Uh, and that's on top of the over-reliance in vaccines for the simple task of boosting human immunity for relatively routine diseases like diphtheria. Now, I'm not a medical doctor or expert, but there's a lot of common sense that gets pushed aside with these uh, pharmaceutical monopolies uh, throwing their weight around. So um, there's just so many questions that you don't see answered, and they just assume vaccines are the answer, no questions asked. Uh, okay, uh, Mark, uh, we're just about out of time, but I just wanted to end. It. I just wanted to end the program uh, with uh, the situation in Hawaii and <laughs> and the uh, what happened over the weekend. So the Federal Communications Commission, the FCC, is apparently launching a, what they're describing as a full investigation into the false alarm that you can see on screen here, which apparently was texted to everybody uh, that has a mobile phone in uh, in Hawaii. It said. Ballistic missile threat inbound to Hawaii. Uh, seek immediate shelter. This is not a drill. Uh, unfortunately, uh, apparently, well, it was either the biggest piece of incompetence or it was a deliberate social engineering experiment, Mark, because I cannot imagine that uh, really it could be anything else. Uh, can you really say that, that they're so incompetent that they build a system that accidentally somebody could send this message out to everybody in the country, on the island, as it were. Uh, apparently, people were, were running from their cars, seeking shelter in absolute panic. Uh, this seemed to me to be much more likely to be something which was assessing public reaction uh, rather than anything else. Boy, things have come a long way from when, in the 1950s, during the Cold War, school children were told there's a drill but in the drill, they had to put their heads down under their school desk, and somehow that would protect them from an H-bomb, that school desk. What a barrier, right? We've come a long way, haven't we? Uh, uh, the, the wonder of cell phones and texting. Um, certainly, to put this as not a drill is uh, shows that there's some definite malice involved here, or what borders on malice, at the very least. Uh, you know, we could look back at the War of the Worlds broadcast by uh, Orson Welles and the fact that that was developed by Council on Foreign Relations uh, agents in part through the early CBS radio network. And some people actually believed that there was a Martian invasion and there were suicides. Now, the, the U.S. population was more innocent then. We didn't have horror movies and shoot 'em up movies and all these things going on. It was before World War II. We weren't desensitized by constant war and violence in reality and on TV. Uh, so uh, there have been scare tactics and psychological operations, psyops, as we call them, going on for decades. And many people cite the War of the Worlds as a quasi-deliberate attempt to do that, to test whether 
media could incite widespread uh, deep-seated panic in people. And to some extent, it worked. Other, people's reali other people realized it was a hoax. I won't make too much of it. But this, where every phone can get the same message at the same time, telling them that there's incoming North Korean missiles, this is dirty pool here, whoever did this. Of course, I'd like to research the exact veracity of all this and get into the background of it. But certainly this this is a uh, taking things to a whole new level um, in in um, engineering human fear and using fear as the as the chief cornerstone of geopolitics. Uh, you know, and I'll add just as we conclude today's show, nobody has proven North Korea can hit a missile on Korea, uh, excuse me, on Hawaii, much less California. Uh, Kim, uh, I don't even know his name, the leader of North Korea, this screwball, claims he can. The U.S. deep state will sort of claim he can or insinuate that he can shoot a, a nuclear payload that far. But no one has actually proven it. And so people have got to get skeptical. They've got to, they've got to learn to uh, do, do their own research and understand that North Korea probably does not have that capability. I think, I we think really we can probably get... go further than that. We can say they definitely don't have that capability. They haven't demonstrated it themselves. Uh, but, you know, there's, there's, two, there's two issues here. Uh, the first is, of course, uh, we, for the first time in history, have uh, the North and South Koreans, or first time in recent history, sorry, the North and South Koreans uh, talking to each other once again. Uh, and uh, so this doesn't help. Uh, but the other point here, the oh. other point here is that we have a huge interest in behavioural uh, in behaviours of uh, of populations, uh, and we have uh, the huge capabilities now through social media to track how people behave uh, whenever something appears in the media or whatever it is. Uh, and uh, uh, this is something that we're looking at in some detail: is how uh, stories that are placed in the media. Um, are resulting in, in, in behavioural research, behavioural analytics, as it's called, but, uh, in this country, uh, because the people, because, uh, and we've got, we know uh, from statements from GCHQ and the NSA and so on that, that they are watching social media, they're tracking uh, people's responses to certain things, and I think that was what was going on here, Mark, uh, and I agree with you, it's a pretty reprehensible way to go about uh, uh, doing this kind of research. Uh, people have become increasingly become lab rats. Um, but look, uh, we've got to leave it there for today. Uh, thank you very much for, for sure. joining us today, Mark. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we will be back. Brian will be back in the studio with me uh, at 1 p.m. tomorrow. Uh, we'll see you then. Thanks again. Bye-bye.